medical school at the American University in Beirut, and then uh, was kind enough to join us as a resident, uh, where he finished in 2014. He's currently um, in the second year of a minimally invasive uh, gynecologic surgery fellowship in Chattanooga. Um, he's up here to give us grand rounds on laparoscopy and pregnancy. Yeah. Thank you very much. For joining Thank you. Us. Yay. So uh, just flashbacks. Um, the first lecture I ever gave here was a grand rounds. Not a grand rounds, grand rounds. It was a journal club about the effect of interleukin-6 as a marker on preterm labor and how to find it, how to calculate it, measure it. Can we use it in our daily life? Um, never thought I'd be back for this. Uh, but it's so nice to see so many faces, great times, lovely past, hopefully a potential future as well. So I thought of a topic that would be interesting in terms of interest to the residents, something different, something that is gyne and OB together, and important for CREOGs. Because you got two to three questions in this whole lecture that is going to be in your next CREOG slash written board. So keep, listen, just listen really closely. Um, so I have no uh, financial interest at all. We'll go back in history. Um, they used to think that pregnancy was a com complete contraindication to doing laparoscopic surgery. Well, this is not true. The first ever surgery done for pregnancy was an ovarian cystectomy in the early 90s by the Najat brothers. Who, the, whoever does not know the Najat brothers, they're kind of like the founding fathers of GYN laparoscopy. Late 80s, early 90s, to the current day, they've written a beautiful textbook it's called the Najat, Najat, Najat Video Laparoscopic Minimal Invasive Surgery Textbook. Um, very smart people. They've written most of the literature that we have today for minimal invasive GYN. So as of today, it's considered a safe procedure, much more preferable than doing laparotomy, and we'll see why. And there's only, if, if performed properly, there's only a 3% conversion rate to open surgery. Have you guys ever done laparoscopy, laparoscopy on pregnant women? Ever? Have you ever had the chance to go see the, the generalists do a coli or an api? I don't see any of the young heads nodding. No? Nothing? Do you still face that impossibility that they're never going to take the patient back when they're pregnant? Does it still happen here? Occasionally? Coli's mostly? Yeah? Okay. Do you have any general surgeons in, in the room? That would have been a nice to have. Anyway, so this is just background information about the physiologic changes in pregnancy. And I'm hopeful, hopefully you guys all know this, but there's an increased ventilation rate in pregnancy. The CO2, arterial CO2 goes down. That leads to respiratory alkalosis. You also have the physiologic anemia, a higher cardiac output, the higher heart rate, which leads to more oxygen consumption, and the increased VTE risk, which is the risk of having a DVT slash um, PE. So any question about this slide? This is kind of like common sense in pregnancy, but I wanted to, to go over these because these are important factors that we take into consideration whenever we take a patient back for laparoscopy when they're pregnant. All of these factors have an input into the surgical preparation, the pre-op, post-op uh, evaluation, and the outcomes. So here's a question for the residents and the students. And I want you guys to interact with me. What common symptoms can appendicitis and pregnancy have? OK. Pain. So many more. <coughs> vomiting, leukocytosis, vomiting. So there's so many symptoms in common to the point that if a woman comes to you and she does have appendicitis, it's so hard to really know for sure and diagnose it if there's not a high clinical suspicion. Okay? And remember, the AP pain is going to be McBurney's, maybe up to the umbilicus. 
could be higher if they're pregnant. So keep that in mind. So those things are, they're very, they share a lot of symptoms, and so it's hard to differentiate what's normal and not in a pregnant woman with suspected appendicitis. And this is the effect of the uterus as it grows with terms, with the trimesters. The higher it gets, the higher it pushes everything up. So you have decreased gastric mobility, the omentum cannot come in to seal an infection as it usually does in someone who does not, who's not pregnant. In addition to that, you see the appendix is way up here. Usually starts down here and goes all the way up. It could be all the way up to the level of the costal margin in the second to third trimester. So those are things you want to think about. With progressing pregnancy, everything goes up higher. So the risk of having non-urgent surgery in pregnancy is 1 in 500. The most common surgery performed in pregnancy is what? It's not there. I'm going to rephrase it. The most common surgery performed in pregnancy. Before, okay, antepartum. <laughs> The most common surgery is cholecystectomy. The most common acute surgery is appendectomy. That small difference in wording is what the written board is about. The most common surgery in pregnancy is cholecystectomy. The most common acute surgery is appy. What's the most common cause of a surgery in pregnancy? Appendicitis. What's the, most, what's the second most common? Cholecystitis. The third most common is? something that I never knew until I read it. Small bowel obstruction. So, why laparoscopy versus laparotomy? Because when you open a pregnant patient, the risks are high. The risk of fetal loss is high. And it's kind of like a bimodal distribution. The first trimester, you get 12% of miscarriage. Second trimester, 8% of preterm labor, and then as you go f further on, it's, it's higher. And that's one of the reasons why surgery is best performed in that second trimester period. So if we look at comparative studies, laparoscopy and laparotomy have no differences in all those categories, except laparoscopy causes less preterm birth, less spontaneous miscarriages. And so that's the benefit of it. In addition to shorter hospital stay, earlier amb ambulation, less VTE and DVT risk, and improved, uh, improved recovery. So in terms of fetal outcomes, they're essentially the same. No changes. So if you can do laparoscopy, you're saving so much of the preterm delivery and complications earlier. And there's so many more additional factors to think about in a pregnant woman. Now, I'm going to go back to just some physics. What's, what's your average perfusion pressure that's going through the uterus to the fetus? How strong is the contraction pressure-wise? Why do we hate strong, strong contractions? Because they can cause the, the blood vessels in the myometrium to close, and so the blood can't get to the baby. So what's that pressure, roughly? Any idea? I don't even know the exact number, but I know that the contraction of the uterus is so much more multiples higher than the actual systolic blood pressure going through the uterus. So let's say it's 120 systolic. That contraction is probably 150 to 160 millimeters of mercury, if not more. So that's just keep in mind the pressures, the differences on, on all of that in pregnancy. What's the average central venous pressure going up to the vena cava? Any idea? Why do you rarely see venous bleeders on laparoscopy? Because your intra-abdominal pressure is 15 millimeters of CO2, and the central venous pressure is less. They won't bleed. You will see an arterial bleeder because it's higher. So these are things you want to think about. If a woman is pregnant having surgery, and the intra-abdominal pressure is 15, there's a risk that the vena cava is going to be collapsed, and no venous return going back up to the heart, less perfusion to the uterus, baby doesn't like it. Keep these in mind. These are very important concepts. That's why we don't go up to 15 in pregnancy. 
of intra-abdominal pressure for laparoscopy. We try to be in the 8 to 12 range to maintain appropriate flow back to the heart of the patient and perfusion to the, to the fetus. Um, that's targeting these primarily. Uterine trauma, you, you'd be surprised. You put in a 5 millimeter trocar and you look at the camera and you're going to see sometimes a fetus. You've got to be aware where the fundus is so that you can go either higher or on the side to not injure the uterus. Um, you do have a higher risk of incisional hernias because the patient's abdomen is already stretching and there's a higher risk of hernias in the future. And keep in mind that <clears throat> it's sometimes not the easiest thing to ventilate a pregnant patient in T-Berg for a long time. And we, we've talked about hemodynamics. So this is from the ACOG. It's one of the committee opinions. And mark the wording. Non-urgent surgery should be performed in the second trimester when preterm contractions are least likely. So if it's not urgent, do it in the second trimester, 16 to 18 weeks. However, if there's an indication for surgery, there should be no delay regardless of trimester. So if you have appendicitis, do surgery. Because a complicated appendix that, that ruptures can cause up to 40% preterm labor versus, I think, 8% if they're not ruptured. So if there's an indication, do not delay treatment so that you have better outcomes. And here's, here's just some ideas about appendicitis in pregnancy. It happens in 1 in 15,000 pregnancies. There's no predilection to any trimester. They have common symptoms such as leukocytosis and pain. It's easier to diagnose it earlier in pregnancy than later because of the fact that the appendix is not moving up yet. <clears throat> in uncomplicated appendicitis, which is just an inflamed appendix, not ruptured, there's a risk of 1.5% to have fetal loss. Perforated goes up to 35%. And so we're talking about significant morbidity if left untreated. And so treat it as early as possible when you have a diagnosis or a high clinical suspicion. There's up to 35% fetal mortality and up to 40% preterm labor risk. Why does preterm labor happen in appendicitis? I mean, it's not the uterus. Any ideas? Why do we have preterm labor with pyelonephritis? Why would we have it with appendicitis? Why would we have it with a ruptured cyst or a torsed cyst? Think about uterine contractions. What can cause them? Right. It's simply peritonitis around the uterus. It's not going to enjoy it. It's going to start contracting, and that's what happens. Um, so when you suspect it, take it out as quickly as possible. Again, appendectomy is the most common acute surgical condition in pregnancy. You will see this on your creog and on your written board. Memorize it. So this is just reiterating the, the, uh, the thought of the appendix going up cephalad with progressing pregnancy. This is just a picture of what an inflamed appendix looks like. It's not ruptured yet, but this was very close to being ruptured. You can see it's very dilated, extremely, um, may, it might not be that clear, but it's very er erythematous and red and angry looking. And, and this is a 27-week uterus. The proximity of those two organs is what causes preterm labor. So inflamed appendix, the omentum cannot get down to it to, to seal it off. And so if it ruptures, you're going to be in preterm labor roughly at 40% chance. This is an MRI of the same process. It's dilated. It's higher than its normal location. And you see the fetus really close by. <clears throat> Don't take this slide as a, an absolute slide. This is basically showing you the location of trocars depending on the uh, trimester of pregnancy. Obviously, you want to be higher than the fundus. If the first, if this is the first trimester one. This is the typical placement for an appendectomy in the first trimester. In a coli, you're going to have that configuration going up towards the gallbladder. But any other reason to do surgery, 
there's two concepts you've got to think about. Be as high as you can away from the fundus and triangulate your trocars. Your camera is going to be in the middle and you need two on different sides to be able to do surgery. If you can't triangulate your trocars, you cannot do the surgery. Okay? Those are the concepts I want you to take from this slide. So what kind of imaging can we do for, appendic for appendices? You can do an ultrasound, a graded compression ultrasound. Your cutoff for diagnosis of appendicitis is 6 millimeters of dilation. If that's not possible, because sometimes you have a retrocecal appendix or you're unable to do it on obese patients, you can do MRI. You can also do a CT scan. It's safe. For the indication, it is safe. Now, a few words about the gallbladder in pregnancy. We all know that pregnant women have a higher risk of having gallstones, cholelithiasis, cholecystitis, uh, pancreatitis from gallstones, biliary colics, all of that. It complicates 0.8% of pregnancies. 40% of women will have symptomatic gallstones. And when we say symptomatic gallstones, what does that mean? What can it cause? A colic most likely, in a worst case scenario, pancreatitis. And that's a beast in pregnancy. I'm sure we've seen it multiple times. I haven't seen preterm labor with it, but it's a very high likelihood as well. Um, eight in 10,000 pregnancies will require a cholecystectomy, and this is the most common surgery performed in pregnancy. Okay? The most common acute surgery is appendectomy. This is the most common surgery. That's another question on your written boards. So an uncomplicated cholecystitis, which is the biliary colic slash mild form of cholecystitis. You have a 5% chance of miscarriage. The other side of the spectrum is full-blown pancreatitis, and that's where your morbidity goes high. And that's up to 60% of miscarriage. In addition to 15% of maternal mortality, that's a high number. I don't know if that's the same number in today's um, um, our capabilities to support patients today, but still, this is what I found in the literature, and that's very high. That's roughly one in 10 patients, if not more, that, are, that might potentially die if untreated. <coughs> so how do you treat people with biliary disease in pregnancy? It's pretty much like any other non-pregnant patient. Bowel rest, NPO, IV hydration, pain meds, uh, and antibiotics. In pregnancy, 70% of people who have a colic will recur. Pretty much you're going to guarantee also a hospitalization from it. So 70% will recur. 90% of those 70% will require in-hospital treatment. And the risk of relapse goes down with progressing pregnancy. <clears throat> so the recommendation is take out the gallbladder at any point in pregnancy if it's causing problems. Now, the general surgeons won't operate beyond, how, how, what's the furthest that you guys have seen here? 20, 24, 34, 34. okay, that's, that's great, that's really good. But the most of them will not operate beyond 34 because of it's so big, it's too risky, the trocars are close to the uterus, we'll wait, that's fine. And they say that in late term, to early term, you can wait post-op and then do it at six weeks when they come back. But the definition of late term is not really clear. As far as safety and feasibility, you can do it up to 32 safely. It's, it's technically difficult, but it's doable. Um, the best window is 16 to 18. So the indications for lap coli in pregnancy will be symptomatic gallstone, a dilated common bile duct, more than 8 millimeters, and a total biliary of more than 1.5. Of course, a pancreatitis picture is also an indication. So, if we look at the literature about laparoscopic procedures in pregnancy, you'll find tons of case series, case reports, retrospective reviews on appendectomies and cholecystectomies done laparoscopically. The first ever reported lap coli was in 1991, 
and essentially they show no differences in fetal outcomes. Okay? And so that's why these differences, in a sense, are favoring laparoscopy. Don't open the patient up, don't increase the risk of preterm labor, laparotomy and that complications with that. Do laparoscopy and they will have better outcomes uh, in terms of hospital stay. The fetal outcomes are the same, maternal outcomes are, are better, so it makes sense to do it laparoscopically. Here's a few special considerations I want the residents to think about in terms of what, what could you do. Um, we talked about this. As the uterus get, gets larger, there's a higher risk of having trocar injuries. Now, we all heard about Palmer's point. I love that concept. All my entries now, nowadays are Palmer's. Every case is a Palmer entry with a Vares needle. But why would it be great on, this, on these cases? I mean, hopefully it won't be up there. You know, the fundus probably won't get that high, um, even in the third trimester. It's going to get close, but you still have a free point called Palmer's point that you can enter in. For first trimester um, surgeries, you can use the, um, the umbilical fold to put in your camera and then anywhere for the throw cars. As it gets progressive, you have to go higher. So, do you guys think DVT risk goes up or down with T-Bird in pregnancy? <coughs> Here's another idea. Do you think left tilt or right tilt for whatever benefit it has is a good thing? My third question is, how would you position your patient on the table for, let's say, a lab cystectomy, and she's pregnant, she's 15 weeks. What's the best way to position them? Give me thoughts. Anyone can contribute. I'm sorry I'm not looking much at this side. I'm just targeting them. Um, Great idea. So what can you do to prevent the compression? Just give them a slight tilt on the bed, not T-Bird, like a slight tilt, a left lateral position, okay? That will, that will drop your uterus slightly to the side and will not compress your venous return, okay? That's, that's, a, that's a very important idea. What's another thing? So t alone it will compress your vessels with a slight tilt, better. IV hydration is extremely important in pregnant women. You have to load their venous system so that it's never compressible. Or if it is, it's limited. That way their venous return is good and the fetal circulation is good. So IV hydration is extremely important. You do have a high risk of DVT and PE and VTE and therefore it is recommended that you give them preoperative heparin two hours before and potentially after until they're ambulatory to prevent that risk. And as Dr. Jernigan says, when you do T-Berg, in a sense, if you're compressing your vessel, you're going to have stasis, high risk of blood clots. So keep those ideas in mind. When you have a pregnant woman, T-Berg is great, little tilt, load them with fluids, and monitor your intra-abdominal CO2 pressure. Don't go too high. If you get to 15 and higher, you're risking some... Uh, you're risking hypercapnia and fetal distress intra-op. Is this making sense? Yeah? Okay. So this is what happens with, uh, with insufflation in the abdomen. Your pressure goes up, your venous return goes down because of compression of the veno venous system. Your eventual result is less perfusion to the baby. How are you going to monitor a fetus in pregnancy? when you're doing laparoscopy. You can't use the regular monitors on the belly because there's a big space of air that is not going to transmit sound. So what can you do? Let's say 12 weeks. And you want to make sure the fetal circulation and the fetus's heart rate is fine. 
I know it's not, you're not going to make any difference anyway in terms of, are you, uh, you might stop surgery if the fetal heart rate is going down, but how can you monitor fetal heart tones in that setting? Yes, stick in a probe, vaginal probe, and listen to the heart rate. Good job. And Katie's been working all night, so. Yeah. <laughs> So put in a probe, listen to the fetal heart tones. You don't have to do a stat C-section, but if the heart tones are dipping or not normal, stop your insufflation for a bit. Give the baby some time to recover. It's just like a pit break, but a CO2 break in that sense. So the anesthesiologist will help you a lot in terms of um, making sure that the lady that the patient is expiring all the CO2 that's being dumped into her by, by monitoring the end tidal CO2. Um, if acidosis develops or the uh, fetal, risk, fetal distress happens, turn the CO2 off, give the patient a break, um, and, and make sure the fetal heart rate, rate goes back up. And the, the utility of serial ABGs in pregnancy is very controversial in this specific setting. There's not enough studies on it yet. These guidelines have been published by the Society of GI Endoscopic Surgeons. Essentially, in a nutshell, they are in favor of laparoscopy in pregnancy. It's safe. You may do it. It's just another society supporting um, surgical uh, intervention in a laparoscopic fashion if needed. And interestingly enough, do not use tocolytics unless there's preterm contractions going on. So in a setting of appendicitis, preterm contractions, you may use tocolytics if you need to. <clears throat> the long-term fetal outcomes of laparoscopic surgery in pregnancy show that there's no delays in the motor, sensory, or social milestones. That's, this is, I think, one of the longest studies they have out there. And so it's safe. Use it if you need to. Now, here's another thought for residents. You go in, there's an 18-week uterus, your, your camera is maybe sub-xiphoid, and the abdominal wall is literally three centimeters away from the fundus, and you need to put in a trocar there, a five-millimeter trocar. What can you do? to minimize the risk of pushing it all the way in and popping the uterus. You can, you can do that. Good thought. Keep going. I want you guys just, there's no right answers. Just, I want to see how you're thinking. So yeah, that, that, that's a great idea. Okay, be very slow and gentle and just keep twisting until your wrist is inflamed, maybe. Um, another idea is a cut down. This is a straight cut down. It's going to be bigger than five, probably, but it's, it's an option. One more thing is use a needle, a long enough spinal needle, and just put it in the skin and see where, it, where is it coming out in the abdominal wall to estimate roughly where your trocar is going to be coming out. And so you can gauge your pressure, gauge your um, strength, and hopefully not perforate the uterus. Another creog question. Residents, what's the most common adnexal mass in pregnancy? That's going to be a no-brainer. Or the most common adnexal cyst in, in, I guess, the young age group. Dermoids, so teratomas, most common. Uh, if, I think the breakdown in all cysts will be roughly a third will be teratomas, a quarter will be serous cyst adenomas, and everything else. So those are the two you've got to remember for the creogs. What's the most common? Dermoid. Second most common? Serous cyst adenoma. Okay? Now what are potential uh, complications that a cyst can have in pregnancy that could affect the pregnancy. Rupture. Torsion. What 
What? Pretty much, yeah. So those two, now, now rupture of a serious cystadenoma is not a big deal because the fluid is going to be resorbed. The rupture of a dermoid, you're talking about a chemical peritonitis that is horrible. Torsion can also cause inflammation in the pelvis and preterm contractions. So in a woman that comes to you at, at 20 weeks with a huge ovarian cyst, you may have to take it out. Now what if they come to you at, let's say, 8 weeks, and they have a simple serous cyst adenoma looking like functional cyst. It's 7 centimeters. It's an asymptomatic. It's just sitting there. Would you take it out? Controversial. I really don't know the right answer. Would you follow on it? Definitely. Do an ultrasound in a few weeks, second, third trimester, see what's happening with it. If it's going away, great. If not, you may potentially consider taking it out because there's that risk of torsion. So back to the numbers. The first two are very important, dermoids and serous cystadenomas. <clears throat> and the risk of malignancies is roughly between 4 to 13 percent for patient counseling purposes. If you use 6 to 7 percent, that's probably a good number. And these patients will require and some form of staging potentially for the cancer they have. Um, you won't know about this until you're intra-op. So if you see any funny looking ultrasound, excrescences, solid components, multiloculated, does not look simple, blood flows increase to it, those are all things you want to keep in mind in terms of I probably should let a GYN oncologist know I'm going to operate on this patient and if it turns out to be malignant, on path, on frozen, they're going to have to come in potentially to do staging. And staging is like any other ovarian cancer. It could involve an omentectomy, lymph nodes, not taking the uterus out in a pregnant woman because you want to wait to, till post-pregnancy. Uh, post <clears throat> um, you mentioned most of these, um, torsion, the, the need for emergent surgery in pregnancy. And one thing that we keep forgetting is obstructed labor. Have you guys seen obstructed labor because of a mass in pregnancy? I've seen it twice. A big fibroid in the cervix. There's no cervix left, no, no normal tissue to dilate. But in this setting, they're talking about a big ovarian mass that basically occupies the lower part of the pelvis. And so it's sometimes difficult to get it moved out so that the baby can transition into the pelvis and labor. So that's also quite common in big masses. These are just MRIs of ovarian cysts. Um, the one on your left side would potentially be the serous cystadenoma. It's fluid-filled, wide, simple-looking. And the other one, I'm not 100% sure, but it could represent a dermoid with those components in it, the calcified, dark components. So when is surgery indicated for adnexal masses in pregnancy? In general, if you have a persistent mass that is more than 6 centimeters that you follow through pregnancy, Year. You can safely take it out between 16 to 18 weeks with minimal morbidity to the fetus and ma mother uh, together. Or if any time some symptomatic um, complications happen because of this cyst, you must take it out okay? at any time in pregnancy. So this is the, the guideline, essentially. So if you find an adnexal mass more than 6 centimeters, if it's symptomatic, do surgery. If it's asymptomatic, follow up. If it grows in size, do surgery. If it stays the same, you can watch it. If it has complex features, do surgery. If it's simple features, you may consider. You don't have to take it out. So it's essentially gauging the, the appearance with the trimester, with the symptomatology moving forward. So here's two good reasons not to wait. A complicated cyst has worse outcomes than an uncomplicated cyst in terms of pregnancy. Let's say there's torsion and inflammation and preterm contractions, potentially preterm labor. So if you have a cyst that's growing, take it out before it becomes symptomatic. 
And keep in mind, the longer you wait, the tougher it is to get these out because you're dealing with a huge gravid uterus that's obstructing your entire field. And as we spoke earlier, you can go up to 32 weeks safely. 34, if people are comfortable doing it, that's fine. Um, but usually 26 to 28 is thought to be the upper limit of safe and feasible um, surgery. We spoke about this, just a few more ideas. Um, you want to put an OG or an NG tube in patients to decompress the stomach because that's where Palmer's point is. If they have a full stomach and you're putting in a varus needle with palm, at Palmer's point, I've, I've put a varus in the stomach multiple times with a tube. So put in an orgastic tube, decompress the stomach, decrease that chance of putting in a hole in the stomach. Nothing happens, it's fine, you just take it back out and, you, and they do well. Um, obviously do not use any instruments that go through the cervix and your T-Berg will allow excellent <coughs> blood flow with tilt. Here's a, just a small idea about Vary's needle um, at Palmer's point. This is your last rib looking down this way. Okay, this is a cut down straight along the rib. This is your abdominal wall right here. And this is your peritoneum slash um, uh, the, the, the inferior fascial edge of the abdominal wall. Okay, Polymer's point is two to three centimeters at the midclavicular line under the costal margin. If you go higher, well, like what happens if you put a varus needle right here? Are you going to hit the diaphragm? Are you going to be in the chest cavity? Do you guys know? Seems like you would. Why? So I use the varus at palm, not palmers, higher, right at the base of the costal margin at 45 degrees pointing up. You won't hit the diaphragm because there you go. But listen to this. The diaphragm does this. It starts here and it does that. I know it's not that simple, but if you look, if you think about it sideways, you have your rib cage right here, right? Well, that's so small. Um, well, it's hard to depict it, but the, the diaphragm starts at that edge of your, your um, rib cage, essentially, and goes back and up. So if you go at 45 degrees, you will not hit the diaphragm. I guarantee you, you won't. Okay? So w what's the cool thing about this angle? When you go down with your varies, you're going to tent this. So you might, it might go straight down into the stomach that's laying down here. But if you go at this angle right here, you're putting the, pre the, the pressure vector on this point right here will not allow any tenting to happen. So 45 degrees at this point going down, you, you're, you're literally just riding the bone on the lower edge and going up. That's the most safe entry. I've done it a thousand times. It's amazing. It's scary. Yes. Potentially. Now the, the needle that I'm talking about is a hollow needle that allows air to go through and it's very small. So if that goes through the stomach, it's fine. You just pull it back out. No. The hole, the hole is, even if it goes through a small bowel, it's okay. You just take it out and it, it, it'll be fine. Yeah, seriously. I'm telling you, I've, 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 Yes. Mm -hmm. The various, you don't have to do anything about it. Now, of course, call them, let them take a look at it, sure, if you want to feel better, but they do not get complicated. Now, remember, there's a slight difference between small bowel and transverse colon. Transverse colon has E. coli in it. Small bowel does too, but to less uh, concentration. Um, the stomach is virtually 
pretty much sterile because of all the acid in it. Anyway, um, I know this sounds crazy. When I first saw it, I was terrified. <laughs> and I'm still terrified, but I'm like, this is just so, it works. And you have to do them at least 100 times to really get comfortable with it. Um, and talking about complications, I have had every single complication you can imagine. I've put a trocar, <laughs> I've put a trocar through the transverse colon. I have. I've I've uh, I've injured an external iliac. I've put a hole. Th I've I've cut the ureter. I've kinked the ureter. Um, but you know what? You learn so much from it because that's what fellowship is about. It's so much surgical load that you learn from it. Um, but all of it was repaired, and patients are fine. <clears throat> anyway, back to this. Um, so we talked about these. I'm not going to go over them again. Um, the, the, the main idea with any laparoscopy in pregnancy is the triangulation so that you can actually work. And that's why a lot of us hate the single sites at Franklin Woods because there's no good triangulation. But there is actually because your camera is going in and pointing down. And your instruments, one is coming in this way with an articulating tip, and the other is coming in this way. And so they are, they are triangulating, but they're sword fighting a lot. But the whole concept of triangulation is laparoscopy. If you cannot triangulate, you can't do surgery. OK? Monitoring of the fetus in pregnancy is mostly done transvaginally. If distress occurs, just decrease the pressure, hyperventilate, wait for the mom and baby to recover. And this is just some more reiteration of the slides we talked about malignancy. Just do some washings. You may have to get someone in to do lymph nodes. And avoid rupturing a dermoid, obviously. That's all I have for this lecture. Um, I am free till 9.15. I know you guys have tons of questions about the crazy stuff we do, so ask me anything you want. Well, we have two now. We're still protecting the uh, I mean, I've heard people doing the progesterone. Um, I've heard people doing just a stitch as well in the hole, like a, like a monocryl, just to prevent it from bleeding or potentially extending more. Now, a, f a, a half a centimeter hole will very unlikely lead to rupture. It won't extend into a rupture. But if you're talking about one centimeter full thickness, that's a different story. It might, this might be a risk of uh, rupture. I'm not positive about the actual numbers, but in a half centimeter hole, we don't even close it. We do it on every, so every straight stick. So the people I work with, some love, they have their own ways. The oncologists do a cut down on every case. A cut down, like the Hassan, every case, which is fine. The, my own <laughs> director does polymers for every case. Like he does a polymers, and then he inflates to 20 millimeters. Why? To increase the, the air between the abdominal wall and the aorta, let's say and the uh, bowels. And then, this is, uh, when I saw this first time, I'm like, this guy's crazy. And then he presses down right here to push all the air up into this portion of the abdomen. And then he puts a troll car in with, you know, the finger and make sure you don't go too far in the belly button with no issues at all. Now, this is assuming there's no previous surgeries and stuff. So that's, that's, that's his entry. 
20 millimeters, as soon as all the troll cars are in, we go down to 15. No, 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 we're talking about general, yeah. But Palmer's point, with him, every case. And you become a master, like you feel the layer, and the minute you, it pops in, you feel it. You know exactly where it is. You do the drop test. You can aspirate if you want. I'm not worried at all because there's no, nothing up here except stomach. Um, so it's, it's very effective. It's the safest point in any kind of patient because they, ne they never have surgery up here unless it's like a bypass, but they rarely have surgery. Depending on the surgery. Like for the endometriosis cases, there's four ports, two by two. Yeah, like, excuse me? What kind of choke cars? So th that's where the cut down would be helpful because that way you're going to have to use a different um, entry point. So usually right here, or you can do a cut down anywhere. You just have to remember that if you are not medial, if you're not in the middle, you're going to deal with two fascial layers. If you go to the side, it's going to be two layers, above and below the muscle. In the middle, it's one, because that's where they fuse. So those are things you want to keep, uh, keep in mind uh, on. Uh, the other way is to go at Palmer's point uh, with a cut down. You'll go through the anterior fascia, muscle, separate the muscle, posterior fascia, cut that, then you'll get the preperitoneal fat, peritoneum, and then you'll be in the abdomen. So you have to keep in mind of all these layers. Central, one layer, anything lateral, potentially two. And I've seen every combination of a gastric band patient or previous hepatectomy, um, multiple laparotomies. Like uh, probably, we've probably operated on 500 patients and one of them had so much adhesions we could not complete the surgery. Like we were, I was trying to do adhesial lysis and I finally find myself in a space of redsius. Yeah, there's a bladder right there thinking that I was, you know, behind the adhesions. I was very, very much behind them. I was, <laughs> I was in the bladder. So we stopped that case. We just aborted it. And things like that happen. These are the patients that no one will operate on. And you try to make a difference, and you get some failures. No, mostly it's the general surgeons who do it. Now, because we don't do appendectomies um, in that setting, I do appendectomies all the time on endometriosis cases, but not with this setting. So my experience in it is not strong enough. But uh, would I do it? I would definitely do it. I'm, I mean, I'm not afraid of it. If you know the anatomical stuff and locations and, 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 and landmarks, you should not be afraid of the pelvis. Now, it's easy for me to say that because I've done so much right now. But when I graduated from here and the, the first day I was there, it was the most terrifying experience in my life because of this stuff. And then they open the retroperitoneum. They go down the pelvis. Now I love the retroperitoneum right now because I'm, I'm comfortable with it. I know where everything is. I'm not afraid of it. But have you seen a ureter on a hysterectomy from start, from the pelvic brim all the way to the paracervical tissue? Have you seen it? Seen it peristalsing while you, you're doing your dissection. That's how we do it today. But it's, I never thought I'd, I'd, I'd never thought I'd be that, doing that. It's very scary because you're half a centimeter from the external iliacs operating, straight stick, with cut mode on 100 watts and coag on 50. It's, it's crazy, but if you understand the energy, and I love the energy lecture. That's one of my favorite topics. We can talk about it later. But if you understand energy, landmarks, and surgery in the pelvis, there's nothing you can't do. Nothing. All right. <laughs>